welcome to everybody. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you Mark Macias Faudia, um, that he will be talking on life beyond the ecological plot, conducting landscape ecology in the Arctic tundra. Um, Mark is professor at the School of Geography and Environment in the University of Oxford, and his research is mostly focused at understanding the coupling between the um, physical and the bi biological systems. And especially today, um, she, I, he will explain some of the research at his lab employing um, remote sensing images to infer the influence of climate and herbivory on tundra vegetation over a range of scales from centimeters to the regional scale. So whenever you want, Mark, um, thanks for coming. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Tere. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. <coughs> uh, uh, I left. <coughs> I left Barcelona in 2003 and initially I was living for seven months <laughs> and I haven't yet come back so it's a warning <laughs> be, care be careful when you leave for a for a period of time um, I'm going to talk today about uh, I will I will start my talk uh, introducing briefly my lab and what we do and then I'm going to focus on a particular aspect of what we have been doing uh, which is this obsession on what what can we really say about, about the responses of, 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 uh, of ecological processes to forcings, environmental change, uh, when thinking spatially at the landscape scale, not just at the plot scale where you can conduct experiments or, or, or get results that you more or less control. Um, and I will base my, my talk in, I don't remember now if it's three or four examples done in the Arctic tundra, which is where we do most of our, of our work. Sadly, uh, this picture now looks even more exotic than, than before because this is the Yamal Peninsula in northwesternmost Siberia, where we have done a lot of research, but obviously now things are uh, not easy in Ukraine. We, we have no access to our, to our sites. Um, okay. That's stupid. Uh, I know, I know the trick. Yeah. You know the trick? The, the screen. <laughs> and now, now it will work? Yeah, I think so. Great. It's funny when you have confirmed this 10 minutes before and everything works well. <laughs> <laughs> the very first thing you try. Uh, as I said, a brief introduction to our lab. We call ourselves the Biogeosciences Group, and this wants to reflect our focus not only on the biological side of things, but also on the, on the landscape and the physical substrates and the abiotic conditions that, that, that interact with, with, with the biotic component of ecosystems. Um, we, are, we try to be systems aware. And when I say that, I mean that we try to think in, in the ecosystem as a, as a, as a, as a suite of, uh, of interacting processes. We try to be process oriented. Although when you work with uh, remote sensing, you normally look at patterns, but we try to never forget that uh, at the end of the day, what we want to learn is what, what processes are operating. Um, this third one, it's probably quite a new one, but we try to be solutions oriented. And what, what I mean with that is that, that we have increasingly felt the need to produce science that can be communicated to managers and stakeholders, especially in the current situation where there is a very obvious uh, multidimensional crisis, uh, uh, environmentally speaking and climatically speaking. So, so we try to, more than before, uh, think about what uses our, our, our research might have on the ground. Uh, we work across scales and uh, I could have written here where scale aware, but this is one of our obsessions in a way. Um, we will work with, with paleoecological records if, if, if the processes we are uh, trying to understand require long-term long, long -term, uh, records that we have always worked with. Uh, with uh, we, have, we have also worked obviously with the observational record and with, with remote sensing data. And there is a focus on cold ecosystems, which started in the Pyrenees many years ago and then kind of migrated north uh, until, until we reached the, the high Arctic. Um, uh, it is an interesting place. Uh, I started uh, working in the Arctic just because I liked the system and also because it was a place where the abiotic processes were really very clearly shaping the, the ecological systems. 
but it turns out it is the fastest warming biome on Earth, uh, home to a suite of amplifying mechanisms which, which are linked with, with the presence of snow and ice. Um, so it is a place that is changing amazingly fast, and hence uh, there is both an urgency and an amazing, uh, an amazing opportunity to, to, to study a system that, that really is changing from one year to the next. Um, so as I said, we focus on processes, but we normally get patterns, uh, especially when we're looking at uh, remote sensing data, which is going to be one of the focus, of, the main focus of my talk today. Um, but in general, I would like to kind of take these couple of concepts from, from the IPCC, the concept of detection and the concept, concept of attribution. Uh, um, when we are studying responses of ecological systems to environmental change, we normally have observations and ideally we'd like them to be high quality, longer, the longer term, the better. And they relate to natural and human systems that we think are relevant to the particular system that we might be studying. And then we would like to have an understanding of the system that we're studying so that we can generate hypotheses. Uh, with this alone, uh, that's, that's what we have to work. Detection would be to determine that there are changes going beyond what we can call natural variability, so that there is a trend in other, in other words, uh, so that something is changing beyond what we would uh, consider a, a steady state uh, state. But attribution is another beast. It's a much more difficult beast, in, which implies causality. So it, 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 it comes after detection, and it basically means what is causing this change that we're observing. And of course, the, the, the problem with, with, with being a with, with working in a system and trying to make attribution is that there are multiple uh, factors that can be confounding whatever question we have. <clears throat> so in, in, in many of the examples that we will see, <clears throat> but not all, uh, our, our question is what warmer temperatures are doing to tundra vegetation. But of course, tundra vegetation is not uh, isolated in a particular controlled area where only temperatures are, are, are rising, but multiple other things are are happening at the same time. Um, so detection, in a way, it's easier. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but it's easier than attribution. Um, and it can be done at, at multiple scales and employing a diversity of approaches. We can have traditional ecological plots. We can use remote sensing. And, and, and you know that, that includes repeat photography, which has been widely used, especially in the past, to basically detect changes. Repeated surveys across gradients or regions, reconstructions using paleoecological archives, meta-analyses, um, and I'm sure I'm not being comprehensive here. There are many ways in which we can uh, get information to, uh, to, to, to detect change. Attribution in ecology, uh, empirical attribution, let's say, meaning measuring things in the field. There is also models, right? But if we're talking about uh, Empirical, empirical work, it's frequently addressed through experiments. And these experiments, uh, when they are in the field, are based on plots. Ideally, they are well replicated. They consist of, of, of a treatment and controls. And then out of this, causal inference is made about whatever responses uh, of whatever uh, ecological system to a given forcing uh, that, has been, that, has been, uh, that has been selected uh, are, 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 are happening. Um, so what happens when you have a system that has multiple drivers of change and you want to know, for example, what is biodiversity doing uh, with climate change or global warming? Um, beyond the plot, you can do something that's not exactly attribution, but the people have come to understand that it's widely understood as attribution, which is what we call associative pattern attribution. Um, so how do you do that? For example, a typical example would be, um, what are butterflies in the UK doing with rising temperatures? So uh, one thing that you could imagine is that they probably are migrating or their ranges are expanding northwards. That would be your prediction. Then you take results from uh, uh, as many studies as possible in the UK to see whether there is any range change. And then from all these results, you can see whether most of them are actually agreeing with your, with your uh, prediction that ranges are expanding northwards or whether there is no signal, right? So 
there is no causality here, but there is a lot of uh, a, a lot of information um, that you can put together under a given hypothesis. And if numbers uh, agree with your prediction, you can be a bit more certain that probably warmer temperatures in the UK are causing a rise in uh, sorry a northwards uh, range expansion or at least range movement of, for example, butterflies. So in other words, the associative pattern attribution would be a way to take all sorts of uh, results and patterns and by putting them together, making it statistically very unlikely that what you're seeing is not what, you, what, what you're trying to see, right? So it's not perfect, like for example, a climate change attribution model where there is a process-based model that you can actually run and you know, um, run it with and without greenhouse forcing, for example, and see that there is a, a clear difference between the outcomes of one or the other. Um, so there is no explicit causality, as I was saying. It's not attribution, strictly speaking, but it's very widely used. And there is quite a heated, I would say, debate about whether we should go beyond that uh, or whether this is evidence enough that things are happening in response to, to changes in, in the environment. Um, but what happens, uh, what happens with plots uh, uh, that basically make up this meta-analysis or these meta-studies? Um, they occur on landscapes. So the position of such plots in the landscape is not very often discussed. You just have a plot in the tree line, for example, and uh, that's your plot and you study it, but you don't really know when you read the literature, how weird that plot is in the landscape. How, how hard was it for you to find the perfect plot that you could conduct your research? Um, and the position of your plot in the landscape is not just, uh, it's not just uh, um, random. Landscapes have structure and wherever you put it, you might have very dominant processes over others, et cetera, et cetera. This is a remote sensing imagery of the tree line in well the Canadian Rockies, and as you can see, they are clearly very well structured, both in the underlying sedimentary sediment and in the overall uh, valley uh, ridge uh, repetition. So, the the degree to which the position in the landscape of our potential plot uh, is affecting both the detection of the change and the causal in, causal inference that we can do uh, on that change is not very often quantified. So how can we really upscale? Um, well, one way is obviously uh, the use of remote sensing in ecology. And it's not a solution for everything because remote sensing is, is, is basically giving you readings that are remotely read from either reflectances or, or, or if you're using a passive, an active sensor from, from, from uh, rebounding um, rays that, that the sensor can, can, can emit uh, to the ground. Uh, but it helps us filling the gaps in the landscape. Um, and basically it gives you the hope that perhaps we can escape the plot. Perhaps we can put that plot in perspective. And when analyzing what the plot is telling us, we can really say more things about what the system overall at the landscape scale is, is, is doing. It has some technical learning curve, which normally has meant that many remote sensing papers are very much remote sensing papers, meaning that they are about patterns and detecting things, not that much about attribution and, 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 and uncovering ecological processes. Uh, but with the advent of a, affordable technologies, and what does that mean? That might mean a, a drone that anyone can have uh, for not, not, not much money, but also with ever more uh, satellites and different sensors, which are both active and passive, as I said. It produces data over a range of scales and resolutions that allows for the design of studies uh, that could be at the appropriate scale or closer, as close as possible to the, the scales of the mechanism that we're interested in, 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 in uh, studying. So after this introduction, I will get into some more meaty uh, uh, examples. So as I said, I'm going to focus on on, on, some, on some studies that we have been doing in the, in the tundra. So the Arctic is warming, it's warming a lot, uh, as I just mentioned. And um, one obvious response is that the tundra uh, has, been, uh, uh, has been increasing in biomass over the last decades. Um, so the question would be, what has been? 
is and will be the response of tundra vegetation to past and current environmental change. And I don't say climate change because there are other things in the tundra, for example, uh, reindeer, um, which are herbivores and they occur at large numbers and they can actually also be uh, a, a driver of vegetation change. To which scale they drive vegetation, that's one of the main questions that we are trying to address. So uh, Arctic warming has been linked to increases in tundra productivity and this tundra productivity has mostly been, uh, been, been done through increases in shrub cover, um, especially uh, deciduous uh, shrubs, uh, willows and alders. So uh, where is this information coming from? On, on the one hand, the information comes from remote sensing. In this case, space-borne satellite remote sensing. Uh, this is, um, this is NVDI, the, the, the normalized difference vegetation index, which is a proxy for, uh, for the greenness of, of the land. And these are trends, linear trends over the satellite period. The darker, the, the greener, the more uh, intense the increase in NDVI has been detected in the, in the tundra. This is the tundra polar projection, Arctic Ocean, North America, Eurasia, and Greenland. And uh, everything above the tree line is, is the biome that we're uh, talking about. Uh, we can take the trends and look, look at them in, as a time series. And what you can see is a steady, with of course interannual variability, increase in, 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 this, in this remote sensing um, uh, index. But we also have evidence at the plot scale. And the plot scale is telling us that mosses and lichens are decreasing with warming in the Arctic and that they are being encroached by the very successful shrub encroachment uh, that some people have um, called the shrubification of the tundra. So it is the shrubs that are really, really taking the lead in basically taking advantage of these warmer temperatures and, and increasing both the productivity of the tundra, but also changing the land cover in the tundra. And this shrubification can happen just because the shrubs get bigger individually or because they get taller or because they basically are successful in expanding their ranges and, and, and encroach into other, other land covers. There is other sources of information. In our case, uh, the reindeer herders told us that the tundra was, was, was grinning and that the tundra was getting shrubbier. In their particular case, they were annoyed at the fact that the shrubs were now taller than the antlers of their reindeer. So they were losing them. They were losing sight of them, which was obviously, it's like losing, losing sight of your, of your assets, of your most precious assets. So it was through participatory uh, qualitative social uh, science that we got uh, first, basically, first, first person evidence that actually there is something going on in the tundra, uh, in this particular case, in the Yamal tundra. So what, what is the consequence if we are thinking in the air system? Uh, well, there are several, but probably the most important consequence of a shrubbier tundra with taller vegetation and woodier uh, Arctic uh, are linked to both uh, their, their ability to change the albedo and their ability to uh, keep snow. So uh, these are two proposed big sort of uh, uh, feedback loops uh, in which uh, the greener tundra might be playing a role. One would be a role linked with albedo. The, the tundra in winter, or not only in winter, in the shoulder seasons, as we call them, fall and spring, gets, snow, uh, gets, gets covered by snow. Tall vegetation is harder to basically be covered in a very neat blanket of continuous snow. Um, that means that when you have the, the, the melt, the melt starts earlier in, in, in vegetation that pops out of the, that might pop out of the, of the, of this blanket of snow, there is the crescent albedo. Also in summer, shrubs and forested areas in general have lower albedo than grasslands and open tundra. So there is a clear positive feedback by which a darker Arctic becomes, uh, um, basically adds to the, adds to the warming by, by trapping more energy through a reduced albedo. Okay, that's one thing. Obviously there are other things ecological, ecologically speaking, if you have taller shrub encroachment in the tundra, you have new niches and you have the opportunity for boreal species to keep on advancing towards, towards the higher Arctic. In some cases, these new niches come in unexpected ways, completely independently of shrubs, for example, in Yamal, 
uh, the uh, Gazprom, which is the main gas extraction company that extracts gas from Yamal, built a railway which was electrified on the poles of the railway where the vectors through which the Peregrine Falcon invaded the tundra uh, because they needed some vertical structure to basically nest and be, uh, be there looking out for voles and, and, their, and their normal prey. So the physical change of having a taller vegetation encroachment in the Arctic facilitates the borealization of the Arctic, which would be another jargon term that is being used to describe what's going on in, in the Arctic. The other one would be uh, the fact that shrubs trap snow in winter. So you have a bigger, fluffier uh, snow cover over, over the winter. And that is a good insulator, which means that the soil warmer, the soils are warmer in winter, which means that this enhances nutrient, nutrient cycling, but it also uh, increases permafrost temperature, which then has big effects, not only on the nutrient cycling, but on the, on the, on the overall carbon budget because they enhance permafrost uh, melt. So this would be the feedbacks where this greening of the tundra could, could be, uh, could be uh, put. So uh, what is changing it? So these are two plots only. One is plot based and the other one is remote sensing based. The remote sensing, what is causing type of studies is purely correlative. The, the tundra is greening and the summers are warmer. And if you correlate them, they are very well correlated. So there has to be a link, right? But by the same reason, uh, sea ice is vanishing. So there might be a link between tundra greening and sea ice decline, right? Because everything is happening at the same time. So as you can see, these correlations are there. They are very unconvincing, not because they are not strong or significant, but it's just because these are two patterns that happen to, 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 to agree, right? At the plot level, uh, we can have, for example, in this particular study, uh, the, the plot level are tree ring chronologies and shrub ring chronologies. And they are also correlative in this particular case. But what they are looking at is what is the season of the year that the shrubs are responding the most to and is the temperatures of the summer. So in a way, again, we, we're down the way in this sort of taking a bunch of correlations and ending up with a question, which is what are the chances that all these things are not really behind what we are looking at? Um, if we go to real experimental plots, there probably are two very classic ways of doing experimental uh, plots in the tundra. One would be the open top chambers by which you encircle a patch of tundra with uh, these uh, uh, this plastic metacrylate uh, structures, which basically enhance the greenhouse effect and artificially warm what's inside of these plots. The other one is uh, exposures, so that you essentially modify the, the pressure of herbivory, but also change the snow uh, conditions and the snow depth uh, in, in inside or outside of the, of the exposure. So this would be typical experimental plots. There is a very famous one in Svalbard where they put a fence to modify the snow depth and if you go there now, it looks like a mini Great Canyon. It started, it started permafrost collapse to such a degree that the whole experiment basically blew out of proportion. And now there is a big gully there just because they increased snow depth uh, with a little fence uh, and, and that warms uh, soil temperature. So how, how many drivers should we take into account when we're trying to figure out what is causing thunder warming? Um, we did a a systematic review some years ago with, with, with Andrew Martin, who's actually here visiting this week, and uh, in which we asked the, the literature in general uh, for papers where uh, response or shock response had been carried out in a statistical way. Um, at least one measure of a shock growth had, had been taken into account um, and, 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 and used as a response variable in which there would be a control uh, so an environmental control external to the shrub had been used. And then we, we looked at where that had been happening. So uh, we ended up, this, this study has many other things, but I just wanted to use it here as an example of how many drivers we should be thinking about. First of all, we have to conceptualize what's a driver. You have proximal drivers and you have uh, uh, um, ultimate drivers. And the proximal ones, which would be the ones that really the plant might be experiencing are the ones that we're looking for. But 
we identified 23 different proximal drivers that had been you know, studied in at least one study in the Arctic, considering the response of, of vegetation to, to environmental change. Out of them, four essentially were dominant. One was their temperature, soil moisture, herbivory pressure, and snow dynamics. Um, as I said, we had location. We also identified, and this is no surprise, but in the Arctic is probably even more, um, more um, acute, the fact that there are clusters from which knowledge comes from. And these clusters are normally infrastructures in the form of research stations that are well-funded and people tend to do their research there. So in this case, we had six, six uh, clusters out of them, three were in the Northern slope of Alaska and three more were in, uh, as you can see, Northern Canada, Abisko in Sweden and Svalbard. Um, well, this is interesting, but it's also interesting if we are, again, as I started to talk, thinking about space and what does it mean uh, in, in the larger picture. Well, it means that for most of the Arctic, which is the Eurasian Arctic, we have very little empirical evidence. Um, and not all the Arctic is the same, right? So uh, it's great that we have Abisko and, and, uh, and, and Tulip Lake, but at the same time, we are overflowing the Arctic literature with experiments done in those particular environments. So um, what is winning then? Uh, we, we know that it disrupts, and we know from remote sensing in this particular couple of studies uh, done yeah, over the same year, uh, on this one, let's start with this one. This one we used Landsat, um, which is 30 meter resolution. So it's quite a fine resolution. And um, first thing you see when you look at trends only in MDBI in this case, is that yes, there is a dominant, the green would be a, a greening Arctic, the red would be negative trends. Uh, it has been called the browning of the Arctic as well. Um, when you start looking at trends, you can get kind of in a rabbit hole there. But most, uh, most uh, pixels in the Arctic that have a significant trend have a trend towards increasing NDVI, increased productivity. Uh, but there is a minor, non significant part of the Arctic which is not increasing. And when we try to understand what's happening on the ground, so we have a heterogeneity in space, not all the Arctic is bringing. When we try to look at what happens from the remote sensing into the landscape, we realize that actually we're looking at many processes, uh, which many times are compounded in pixels, which is the unit of the remote sensing imagery, uh, which might be way too big to really tease out what's really going on, right? The, 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 the longest uh, time series we have are, uh, are 40 years, but the resolution is eight kilometers by eight kilometers. That's, that's a huge pixel where many things can be happening. And the moment you start looking at landscape scale processes, uh, you realize that, for example, these browning trends correspond to coastal erosion uh, and, and permafrost thaw. Uh, so um, there is a heterogeneity there. And the drivers of the browning and the greening might be really, really diverse, even though there is an overall uh, big warming trend. Again, this is uh, based on plots. And what we found was that the response to warming was stronger in wetter climates, in more mesic sites, in wetter soils, at lower latitudes in the Arctic, which is not surprising because that's where we have the high, the, the total shrubs, which have the capacity to really grow. Um, and, uh, and well, you know, as I said uh, already, already now, where more, more tall shrub, shrubs dominate. So not all the Arctic is greening. And this greening is concentrated in certain places, at least the greening that can be directly linked with warmer temperatures. Um, I mentioned sea ice. I'm going to explain this, this example. That's probably going to be the, the longest case that I will, that I will show. But I decided to talk about this example because it kind of uh, it it gives an in, it gives a clear way in which is the framework in which we use spatial data to find patterns to try to figure out what is happening behind behind what's driving those those, those signals. So as I said, um, um, CI's decline has also been linked statistically with the fact that the tundra is greening, and mm, the reasons behind that have been diverse and elusive at times. This is as well works in. Uh, in, 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 in the Barents Sea at around 80 degrees north, it's the high Arctic. And these colors here are sea ice concentration on a given month. And so we have 
uh, higher sea ice concentration towards the north, very close to the North Pole, and in the east as well, where there is a uh, higher sea ice concentration. So just to put this uh, uh, under a little framework, and I'm not going to expand too much because I already mentioned it, sea ice would not be a proximal factor you know, driving greening, but it could be an ultimate or indirect factor. How? Well, sea ice can modify the physical system. For example, can modify the weather and the climate, and that can modify directly the conditions that the plants are experiencing, but it also can change things which are linked with what plants experience. For example, the, the geomorphology of, the, of a given place, which then will be experienced by the plants. But it, it is also directly affecting a suite of, uh, of livelihoods, of animals uh, that depend directly on sea ice. Some of them hunt there, and if there is no sea ice, they will hunt on land, and through that they can affect, uh, they can affect terrestrial systems, et cetera, et cetera. So the way that sea ice affects terrestrial systems can be direct, will never be direct, sorry, except for coastal erosion, uh, potentially, but it can be indirect through the modification of the physical system or through um, biotic chains. So, um, we have a steep dec decline in Arctic sea ice. That's kind of probably material for another talk, but uh, you probably are very familiar that sea ice has been declining in the Arctic very sharply. Uh, we're talking about uh, 23 or 30 percent of the of the winter of the, of the summer cover uh, uh, the, uh, shrinkage in, in, in a couple of decades. Um, but the, the links between sea ice and temperature productivity beyond those kind of agreements in the fact that one is increasing and the other is decreasing have been all over the place. Uh, some are using um, uh, sea ice over the whole Arctic, which kind of it's, it's, it's an index that it's very difficult to pin down to a given place. Why is it affecting this particular place? The whole Arctic uh, sea ice changing. Um, others are using uh, uh, metrics which are completely diverse. Somebody, some, some studies have been focusing on winter sea ice, others on spring, others on summer. Uh, others have found that there is a huge influence of sea ice, others find that there is no influence of sea ice. And in a way, I think we're hitting here the wall of just having patterns and identifying things. Uh, the classic paper that ends by the dead saying it's very complicated type of thing, because on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, I found it here, I didn't find it there, I don't know why, uh, type of thing. Um, so in in all cases, though, there is a link to the Arctic amplification. And the Arctic amplification is this process of positive feedbacks in the Arctic, which are linked to the albedo and the presence of snow and ice, which means that when it starts melting, the Arctic warms faster than the rest of the, the world. But when it starts cooling, it cools faster too. It's a very sensitive system climatically. Um, and uh, the Arctic amplification is proposed for this link. So how is the Arctic amplification really working? Well, again, it's a matter of scale. You can look at the whole of the Arctic and you can see that the whole of the Arctic on average is warming more than the rest of the lower latitudes. Uh, but it also occurs in processes that are a bit more tangible physically at local and sub-regional scales. How does that happen? Well, it happens both in the autumn uh, or if you have sea ice close by at any season, but also in the summer. So in the autumn, it happens because if there is less sea ice, there is more heat coming from the ocean, which warms the adjacent surface. It also gives more moisture to the adjacent surface. So this would be an Arctic amplification occurring at a, at a regional scale. Um, but it also happens with what, what was labeled in the 80s, the sea breeze. And the sea breeze would be La Marinada from here, but hardcore. Uh, you have sea ice on top of the ocean. Uh, the surface of the earth is warming. The ocean is at zero degrees and you have a constant breeze, which is very chilly, that affects the adjacent land, right? And uh, if you have the right topography, it can go inland for hundreds of kilometers, for example, in the northern slope of Alaska. And if that happens during the growing season, it might affect regionally what plants are doing. Um, so if we, if we understand the Arctic amplification like this, then we can start trying to constrain the spatial scales at which we could find something if we're using remote sensing data. So um, in the local subregional uh, case, if we have sea ice in the summer close to the coast, this cold air advection should be seen in lower productivity of the vegetation occurring close to that sea ice covered um, uh, coastline. In the autumn, uh, we should see this, 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 warmer, this warmer conditions 
uh, close to places that have no sea ice, right? So we could constrain it. The autumn one, we will leave it aside because we're talking about the growing season, but we could focus on what's going on in the summer to detect whether there is that mechanism leaving fingerprints, special fingerprints in, in, in Svalbard. Um, in the larger scale, we could have very large correlations which are not spatially constrained. Basically, sea ice is affecting overall circulation in the Arctic, which is affecting tundra greening, and they are linked, but there is no real clear, uh, they, they don't need to, to be adjacent one to the other, okay? So what did we do here? Oh yeah, well, I explained that. Uh, we're looking for signatures in the spatial patterns of these spatial, spatial temporal uh, data sets of, of, of sea ice in this case, and tundra greening in the other. So Svalbard is a good system to study, uh, in part or mostly because it's not too big. It has a lot of data. Um, this is the North Cap and northernmost of Scandia. And it has a Western part, which is affected by the northernmost part of the North Atlantic currents that get into the Barents Sea. And an Eastern part that is an Eastern part that is unaffected by this, uh, or that is less affected by this Northern, Northern Atlantic circulation, which means that the West is quite warm in Svalbard terms uh, with not much sea ice and the East is much more continental and much sea ice rich. So you can see this uh, for a time series of sea ice that covers about the first 20 years of the 21st century. These are sea ice concentrations and this would be mid-May, mid-June and mid-July. As the season advances, we get into these bluer colors, which means open water. Um, but you can clearly see that by mid-May, Virtually all Eastern Svalbard is covered with high concentration sea ice. Western Svalbard has no sea ice. By mid-June, we keep on not having sea ice. Uh, we have lost the sea ice in the fjords of the West, but apart from that, uh, there is no sea ice here. There's still remaining sea ice in the East. And come July, there is some sea ice drifting along, but at low concentrations in the East and none in the West. So what we have done in this study is to split Svalbard in the warm West and the cold East. Um, and we had sea ice data, but we also had remote sensing NDVI. And it looks a bit poor because 60% of Svalbard is covered in ice. So at the end of the day, what you get is the green parts of Svalbard, which are in the lowlands, and especially in the interior of fjords, which have less sea ice um, in, 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 in the archipelago. So we use this work, we use this data, which is not easy to obtain because Svalbard is very often covered with clouds. So it, it took a while to create this, this, this data set um, at 200 meter resolution. And we have the sea ice data uh, provided by the Norwegian uh, uh, Environment Agency. So very briefly about the methods so that you can more or less figure out what the maps that I'm gonna show depict. But we use this singular value decomposition. And essentially this, this, this had been used initially in, uh, by, by weather, by, 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 by meteorologists. You have two fields and the two fields are spatially explicit and you have time series of both. And you wanna see one field, how one field coverability links with the other field coverability. You can be spatially explicit. So early studies were wondering what is the effect of ENSO in the precipitation of Western North America. You can use singular value decomposition and you have a field which is precipitation in Western North America and another field which is sea surface temperatures across the tropical Pacific. And you can see whether the covariability there is related with the covariability in your other field. So it works well to study this, the statistical linkages between spatial temporal variabilities of two fields which are, not a, which are occurring in different places. So in our case, one field is sea ice and the other field is NDVI in Svalbard in this region that we decided to study. And we're gonna focus on the early growing season, the peak of the growing season and the late growing season. Um, and we're gonna do that for East and West. So this is, this is um, uh, what, what yes, the, 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 the statistic here would be the heterogeneous correlation field, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that uh, places that are dark blue are very highly negatively correlated uh, with places here that in, the, in, in you, you have these little land pixels which are in the VI, and then you have all the all the all the sea ice um, data where there is no values it's that it's open ocean right so we have no sea ice data we didn't play 
uh, in the in the in the model, uh, in the statistical model. So in Easter's Valbert, what do we see? In Easter's Valbert, we see that uh, sea ice areas close to the coast are very linked with what growth is happening adjacent to the coast. Whereas in West's Valbert, we see that the overall sea ice, which is in the high Arctic Ocean, quite distant from the areas where sea ice is happening, is correlated with whether there is early greening or not. If we go to the summer, we see more or less the same picture. High values of the variability of sea ice in the high, in, in the high north is linked with the variability of greening in the west, but in the east, you keep on having the sea ice adjacent to the land being linked with what happens in the little places that are green um, in, in Eastern Svalbard. So, in this case, our, our hypothesis for a regional to local um, uh, forcing of sea ice on tundra vegetation works for the east uh, because there is a special signature that tells you if you have sea ice here, you have less growth here, okay? But it doesn't really apply to the west. You have sea ice up here and somehow magically I'm controlling what's happening in the inner fjords. It's correlated but it doesn't have a special signature that would allow you to tell you, oh, this is probably what's happening. The sea breeze doesn't come from here into the inner fjords of, of, of Spitsbergen. Interestingly, this variability is linked with the North Atlantic oscillation. Um, and that uh, I mentioned this here just because uh, the variability that's linked with the North Atlantic oscillation only is significant in Western Spitsbergen, not Western Svalbard, not in Eastern Svalbard. And why so? So basically the North Atlantic oscillation is a good proxy for the North Atlantic currents and the strength of the advection of Southern air floor, uh, Southern air into the, into the high Arctic. And it so happens that uh, our hypothesis is that these two things, the growth of vegetation in, Swalwer, in Western Swalwer and the sea ice occurrence in, Northern, in the Northern seas, uh, well in the Arctic ocean uh, are correlated through the action of this advection of of, of, of ocean currents and wind from the south basically mean that if you have a very positive NAO, you have a lot of heat coming into Western Svalbard, which means that things are gonna green up earlier, but it also means that the sea ice is gonna be pushed northwards. And that causes a correlation between these two. But in here, we are in another world. We are in a world where sea ice is affecting vegetation. It's not affected by NAO because the infection is not really uh, affecting the east. And, uh, and the signature is that of, uh, of sea ice uh, being close to the coast, the one that matters. Um, yeah, that would be for June and July. And this would be the correlation between NAO, June and July, and the MDVI in, in both places. I didn't put a color scale here, but the significances are, are only occurring in the west of Svalbard. The east of Svalbard is locally controlled by the presence of sea ice. So uh, what happens when the growing season uh, basically advances enough? So that there is no, not much sea ice adjacent to the land. Well, then we get into the east becoming like the west, right? And what you have is that only this large scale variability of sea ice is linked statistically with what's happening with the MDBI, but there is no more spatial signature that would allow us to identify uh, what's going on in the, in the in, in terms of the mechanism. So distinct sea ice versus standard productivity, uh, spatial signatures can result and then they depend on the dimensions and characteristics of the, of the, of the mechanism that we can be uh, looking at. Um, we identify local and large scale, large, large scale modes of variability. Uh, they were robust geographically and they were linked to the arrangement that we thought that would be actually driving or they should be driving uh, variability if we think that, uh, that, that the mechanism that we're thinking of should be operating. So um, if you have abundant sea ice near the coast, you can have this, this linkage between sea ice and tundra greening. Uh, but, uh, but if you don't, then you get into another world in which there is teleconnections essentially, so that you cannot explicitly link sea ice with tundra greening without either 
a bigger model or without considering that both can be the result of a lurking of a lurking uh, process in this case it was the NAO and um, I have been talking for 43 minutes and I know I have another case but I don't want to overload you so I might skip that case and we keep it light let's say um, otherwise it's going to be one of these talks where I go from one side to the next and people are getting getting anxious so uh, that summarizes the approach that we can take with remote sensing trying to uncover mechanisms that might be that might be uh, driving changes in changes in productivity um, the other case that I had that I won't discuss uh, is uh, much more recent it's work uh, done through a PhD of a of a student who's finishing this year and he has been working intensively in trying to tease out whether we can actually detect signals of herbivory at the regional scale on vegetation. Um, there is, uh, I will introduce the case and then finish, but there is, a, there is a very interesting hypothesis by which the role of herbivores can change vegetation in the Arctic from this shrub encroachment into open pasture land, which is gonna have all these knock-on effects on the earth system of increasing albedo, protecting permafrost. This is thought to have operated during the Pleistocene uh, with large and diverse megafauna. Um, but of course, we have no plot from the Pleistocene apart from paleopological data. We have some models, but we have some observations currently on the effects of herbivores on the Arctic tundra. And of course, we don't have mammoths, we don't have woolly rhinos. Our Arctic tundra herbivore tool set is quite limited, but we have musk oxen and we have especially reindeer. And reindeer dominates all over the Arctic. And with reindeer, it has been found that in places with very intense use of, uh, of the land by, by, by reindeer, like for example, Northern Fenascandia, uh, they can prevent wood encroachment through basically removing biomass and trampling. They can promote persistent grass dominated systems, but this is in cases where they really are uh, occurring at very high densities. For example, in enclosures, milking grounds, uh, old milking grounds in sunny land or, 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 or enclosures in, 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 in the autumn. They can modify land cover and albedo. They change the species composition uh, in, the, in the direction of opening up the vegetation and allowing for plants that might have been encroached by shrubs to be, to be, uh, to, to be allowed to exist. Uh, and they shift this tall shrub and forest tundra to savanna type landscape. And uh, we have a current project, which won't happen in Pleistocene Park in Northeastern Russia, uh, where we wanted to test this. This is a, a large scale experiment where plenty of megafauna, megafauna existing extant megafauna has been enclosed in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in a large area we wanted to use that area to test all these hypotheses, but uh, as I said before, we are now uh, migrating out of Russia with our research. Uh, it's sad, and I hope it doesn't last for too long. But the current situation doesn't—it's not—it's not great. Um, but in any case, the, the 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 experiment doesn't exist elsewhere, so we will have to adapt to other um, other ways. Um, the study that I was going to present was looking at the effect of reindeer. Uh, on uh, Yamal Peninsula, which is a peninsula roughly 70,000 square kilometers, which harbors 150,000 reindeer. It's the largest reindeer herd on earth. And if there is a place where we should find a fingerprint of herbivory in the tundra, we could start here, right? At present, not in the past where you had mammoths and, and, other, and other creatures. Um, Marcus Spiegel, who is a student, used remote sensing and participatory observation. Every one of these little polygons results from a couple of anthropologists in Russia interviewing reindeer herders and asking them where their reindeers are in different types of times of the, of the summer and how many they have. So the different colors are different sizes of reindeer herds and the polygons are the regions that over the last two and a half decades at least, the reindeer, different reindeer families have respected. They, they basically, because they are different families, they, they don't kind of encroach into the land of other families. So you have this kind of a migration from the boreal forest north into the Arctic, uh, the Arctic uh, meadows and south again at the end of the summer. 
So we have been using this in this sort of associative pattern distribution approach to figure out whether in these places we find vegetation that is significantly different in land cover and that is responding significantly to climate than in places where there is no such pasture usage of the reindeer. So we have been using that. Um, as, I, as I promised, I'm not gonna expand more on that. Um, the, other, the other thing that Marcus has been doing is at a much smaller scale using drones and figuring out whether we can map the 3D structure of the tundra, have a reindeer herd arrive, and after it has left, we can map it again and quantify the biomass that has been removed from that plot through photogrammetry um, and, and hence have a landscape quantification of how much material a given reindeer herd can remove from the tundra in one go when they, when they visit the tundra. So I'm gonna skip all these slides now uh, and I will finish with the conclusions. Uh, there were not many, but uh, it's, 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 it's long enough. Um, so in general, when we work on attribution at landscape scale and larger, we have very noisy data. We don't have controls. We don't have replicates. And so we have to figure out other ways to be confident about whether we are finding really a response to something that we think or whether we are just looking at you know, uh, the shapes of the clouds. Um, we should carefully consider always the scale of the process involved. And uh, I hope that the, the example for Svalbard kind of gives, gives, a, gives a, an example on that. We should consider whether uh, the grain of our data, the length of our time series, and the scale of which, at which we are trying to figure our, 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 out our signal is really in line with the scale that we would think that a given mechanism of processes is working. Uh, we need to think about space. And I would, one little obsession of mine is to escape the fact that you found that in your little open top chamber and hence the tundra is doing that. You know, this jump from the top chamber into the tundra, even into the fjord where the, the open top chamber was, is too wild. We have to, we have to explicitly think in space, not just as the place where it happens so that if I have 10, then I have more, but on where it happens and what does that mean uh, geomorphologically and geologically and, and physically. Um, the ever more accurate and precise remote sensing uh, imagery and technology, they offer a huge tool set that, that I, I think can change the way that we do ecology. Um, we're about to get, for example, with the structure from motion, this photogrammetry, we're, we're about to get into the real units of biomass. So we're gonna have biomass removed by reindeers at the landscape scale explicitly in, you know, in a year or two. So that's very exciting because then we can fit these numbers into landscape uh, explicit uh, um, process-based models. Um, and we, we, we can do that, but Probably the time is not only right because of technology, but we really need it given the need in our system science to, to quantify with accuracy the flows of matters and, matter and energy. And we will always need ecological plots. They are essential. Remote sensing without ground truthing is, again, looking at the shape of the clouds. But at the same time, remote sensing can inform where to put the ecological plots and what these ecological plots mean um, really at the landscape scale. So, um, yeah, that's, that's me. Thank you.